Hi, Destin. Greetings, Matt. So we have a plan for this episode. It's happening. But I don't want to talk too much, so why don't you tell us what it's about? Yeah, so we have a subreddit, um, the official subreddit where the post um, episode discussion takes place is r slash no dumb questions. Mm -hmm. But the unofficial subreddit, the unofficial official subreddit, because we're technically Mm -hmm. mods, is r slash ndq. And that's where like various and sundry topics can be discussed. That's where the magic happens. Yeah, it's kind of where the magic happens. Depending on how you define magic. That's right. So, um, yeah, someone in there was awesome enough to, let's see if we can get a name. I got a name right here. The answer to your question is Mook. M-V-O-V-I-R-I. I'm going to say Memvovery. <laughs> yes, so Mr. Ovaries has, has done everything for us here. He's compiled all the questions <laughs> that people um, people make when they come to this subreddit, r slash NDQ, and think it is r slash no stupid questions. And the way Reddit works, for those of you who may not use Reddit, is people will just wander into no stupid questions, and they will ask whatever's on their mind, knowing that they will find no judgment from the people inside the subreddit. And But they're confused. And so... Because here you will find judgment. <laughs> and tons of it. Most of it sounds like this. This is actually a subreddit dedicated to the podcast, No Dumb Questions. You might want to try your question over at r slash no stupid questions. Exactly. Which actually doesn't sound that judgmental. But the cool thing way. is people people have embraced these uh, wayfaring strangers. It's like, I don't know, it, it, to me it feels like an ancient traveler on a road stumbles <laughs> into a bar for a pint and they walk mm-hmm. in and they're like, hey, oh. Uh, I got I got a question. <laughs> and well, what ancient wayfarers did that? I don't I'm trying know. To think of this motif. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, like the ancient traveler who staggers in and why do so many people like Star Trek? Uh, like I'm just not familiar with that. Is uh is life in Scandinavia as good as Americans <laughs> liberals claim? <laughs> <laughs> oh come on over here, bio, we'll have a conversation with you. <laughs> hey, uh got a question real quick. Um why are mid-length socks called crew socks? <laughs> what they're is the all cr- interesting questions? <laughs> they're, they're fantastic questions. But man, it's it really is like a, as a social situation goes, it is like somebody just staggered in out of nowhere yeah. to a fully functioning circle of people who are having a discussion. It's like, hey, also, where did crew socks come from? <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, and you were. <laughs> yeah, we were talking uh-huh. about the you know Poli- the Polish winged czar saving Europe. Yeah, I know, but um, what about these socks? <laughs> How do we I were buy just talking Adobe about the apps. Chinese social credit system? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so we have agreed to go yep. through several of these, and um, we're going to answer them because there's no dumb questions, right? We're going to go through these, and you're prepared, right? Yes, even out of context questions aren't dumb questions, right? Yeah, right. And and so uh, I, I've just gone through the list myself, and I've got several that I just want to talk about with you. Are you, are you game for that? So we're going to answer all these um, these kind travelers. <laughs> okay, gonna... oh, pop the brakes. We're not going to answer all of them, are we? Oh, they... no, 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 not all of them. I no. mean, how many are there? Are there like two hundred or? Something? I mean, it's not that much. Maybe a hundred. I don't know, Mister Overy. Uh, he he compiled a... what. I, I don't think we want to call him Mr. Overy. I don't think that's what he... I, I don't think it's Mr. Overy. I think it's Mvovery. Mvovery. You call him whatever you want. It's Mr. Overy in my mind, and oh, we're doing whatever that's we really want. This is the unofficial official subreddit. So, okay. um, All right. how would you like to do this? Would you like to just go back and forth, and you take a, a drunken stranger question, and then I do the same, and we just roll down the mix? Or what do you want to do? Okay. I, I actually did mark some of these down that I kind of wanted to take a little bit of a run at. And oh what yeah, I, I, prepared. Fun, cause, I prepared. So did you prepare with like questions that are in your wheelhouse? Kinda, but then some I just want to talk to you about because we're friends, right? And I just want to just talk it out. I, it's always weird when you say because we're friends, and well, then I have to like right? keep, keep convincing you. Like still, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are friends, my friend, and I would be happy to talk about friend things with a friend like you. So I've got I got some questions. Let's just bounce back and forth. But let's do this. Let's ask the question of the other person before we speak to the question we picked ourselves. Does that make sense? Uh, that sounds great to me. Um, but what I'm going to do is every time I ask a question, I'm going to act like I just stumbled in out of the cold. Oh, OK. Where are you going to be from? Uh, just different places. It just depends. 
Okay. Um, I'm going to do the same Mm because I think it'll be weird if we don't. Yeah. Which means you'll also need to probably play the barkeep whenever I'm asking questions. Okay, cool. What can I get for you, sir? Uh, I got a question, man. Um, Uh, Sure. How can I help? What impact does lifespan have on being human? (laughs) That was more fun than I thought it would be. I had anticipated you asking a question about our menu or drinks. I did not anticipate that. No, 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 no. Oh, so, okay. My name is Chester Cat One. That's cat with a K. So, mm-hmm. based off, not based off, but based off of what we know about people over the course of history, mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. would civilization look like if we lived a, a notably shorter or longer amount of time? It's probably pretty easy to think about a short lifespan, but what if you lived to be 500 years old as a standard? Whoa. Barkeep. <laughs> Well, well, first of all, M Cat, what was it? Cheshire Cat One. Uh, Cheshire this, Cat One. Yeah. This was a month ago that uh, Cheshire Cat stumbled into the subreddit and asked this. I like the question. So, uh, what, what do you think about it? I think it would really change the way we prioritize. So, you know, you know, I do some counseling and stuff as part of my job. Yeah, and pastor. When you lay awake at night and you think about, all the things that you've heard from all the people and all the things we deal with, you kind of start to see patterns like, oh, there's this category of problem and there's this category of problem. But then you start eventually to lump the categories into categories until eventually you figure out it's all because you're going to die someday. Oh, yeah. This is your theory on life in general, that it's this slow, steady march toward death that motivates people to do things. The glacier that is the source of all the streams that come down the mountain in different ways and manifest in different ways is death. Really? I kind of think so. Some people say it's sex. I think people like that a lot. I'm a fan. But I think death is a more lingering, lifelong motivator. And I think even those things that are stuff that we do out of passion or pursuit. If you had 500 years, I mean, what's the rush? You'll get around to it, right? I've often thought, okay, so in the Bible, there are several people that lived... Well, I guess before Genesis chapter 6 in the Bible, there are people that lived a really long time, like hundreds and hundreds of years. I think Methuselah was, what, 900 and something? You're supposed to know this. You went to college for this. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely know all of those. Yeah. Yeah, it was, like a, it was like a millennium is the claim. It's the way the story goes. Basically. So I've often thought when I'm driving down the road and, like, Grandma is in front of me in, in her Cadillac going really, really slow. I've often thought, you know, she's not in a hurry because, you know, she's been alive for 70 years. Like, she's eventually going to get to wherever she's going, and she's not, like, rushing to get there because whatever she's going to do is going to happen one way or another, whether it's today or tomorrow, whatever. And I've often thought about what would happen if you're just, like, you know, you've got the ox goad and you're you're flicking the back of your ox to get your ox cart going, and you, and you pull behind the ox cart of Methuselah. <laughs> you oh, know? mercy. You know what I mean? And you're come like, on, man. Come, come on. Yeah. Th- this Joker's yeah. been everywhere, seen everything. It, it kind of reminds me of Highlander. You've, you've watched the Highlander stuff, Who right? Who wants to live forever? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They had, uh, they had a Scotsman play the Egyptian who trained the English guy who played a Scotsman. You had Sean Connery, and you didn't have him play the Highlander. Well, tell me yes, this. I've so, seen the Highlander. So the Highlander is, I, I, I'm kind of fuzzy on the story. It's these these guys that live forever, and there's only a few of them on Earth. And Well, there it, can be only one. And if they kill another Highlander, then they take his power? I think so. But the only I just w- remember Christopher Lambert and Lightning, and there, but, wasn't the bad guy called like the Kurgan or something? No, seriously, I, I'm even fuzzy on the story details and like the rules of how it works. But long story short, if they chop off the head of another one, they behead mm-hmm. him, they take his power, mm-hmm. and then yeah. they, they live forever. And one of the things I do remember, though, is that these people would live throughout different periods of time, and their loved ones would come and go and die, not unlike how dogs are in our lives. Yeah. you know, And that, that made me feel stuff. When I watched that movie for the first time as a young man... And you do you have that queen anthem who wants to live forever over the top, 
And then it's like the aging happens and it was super sad. And then I felt the same stuff again in uh, Benjamin Button when they have the moment where they pass at the same age and then it goes the other way. Super sad, man. Hmm. I've not, I've not seen that. Yeah. So, so how would your life be different? But it's interesting. How would your life be different? Your, how would you approach life differently if you knew you would live for several hundred years instead of, you know, max a hundred. Hmm. Let's game that out just a little. Okay, let's say let's say a thousand year life. All right. Yeah. So if this was your death year, twenty nineteen, and you'd lived a thousand years, that means you were born in ten nineteen. Hmm. So if we go with a ratio of a hundred year life, that means when you were an early, like when you were a kid, an elementary school kid, uh, let's say you're in Europe, you were watching the Crusades unfold. Oh wow. So Richard the Third, the Lionheart, he he would have been your your king when you were the equivalent of nine. I mean, you would have been ninety or something like that. But you know, he would have been like your your kid king, right? Yeah. And then you would have seen that get resolved. You would have seen um, the reconquest. So the Muslims in Spain and Portugal, you would have seen them driven out. You would have seen the Inquisition as a teenager. Um, you would have seen the Italian Renaissance as a 20 year old college kid through your thirties. That would have been like the soundtrack of your twenties would have been the Italian Renaissance. The reformation would have happened when you were a middle-aged man with a family. You would have seen the authority of the Catholic church crumble. You would have seen the 30 years war as a man in his early sixties. You would have seen the invention of steam power As a man in his 70s or 80s, you would have seen the liberal revolutions of the West in the 70s and 80s. And as a very old man, you would have seen all the inventions of the 20th century right on up from, you know, flight and automobiles all the way up to cell phones. So I don't know, I guess I could bounce the question back to you in light of that. If you lived a thousand years and that was how your decades spanned out, how would that affect the way you lived? What I like about the way you viewed it is you didn't have the person go through puberty and mature like in 20 revolutions around the sun. Right. You had the the person, you stretched out the maturing process as well. I think that, I don't think that would work because people do dangerous stuff when they're young. Oh, great point. Yeah, you're right. You wouldn't get through your teenage years. You wouldn't, no. Mm-mm, that's That's 10 times more opportunities to get killed ramping your bike off of something. Yeah, I have. I mean, war would mean a lot more, wouldn't it? Oh, if you took a life, it would mean more. Yeah. I mean, you're depriving somebody of 900 years if you took their life as a 100-year-old man. Yeah. What about women? Oh, dude. What about women? How long do they get to have babies? Oh, man. Do we do we spread that out the same amount of time? Oh, holy I mean, moly, they dude. start having babies at 140 and they can have babies safely until they're like 450 i mean that's so many babies and if you like got married to one person wow Wow, that's a long run (laughs) i I could just say i could do two of those lifetimes with my wife well played i gotta say what do you mean well played you you act like that was strategy because i know she's going to be listening to this someday and i was planning ahead i mean that's no dude i would never accuse you of such forethought calculation and good judgment (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it would change things for sure um i think i think there would be less war because uh i believe people would realize that you know trends and thought would come and go so i think pe- people would be more level-headed for sure well trends and thought wouldn't come and go at the same rate I, I, you would can you imagine having like the moral grounding and clarity and patience. Like, can you imagine having all the strengths of the previous generations and all the strengths of the right now generation all mushed into one person? Man. So instead of like societal conflict between young and old, and like you wouldn't nickname a new generation every eight years for crying out loud and then pit them against each other like we do now. Like they'd all have all of those attributes. You'd have some... I think you'd have some quality people. I think that's why, in general, in my life, I try to maintain an eternal perspective. I attempt to do that. 
I don't know, I believe in souls. And so I think that things that I do now have consequences for longer than the time I'm on earth. And so I try to treat people as if the same is true for them. And so I don't know. I, th- I think I would value the same things, me personally. I don't know. That's an interesting question. I don't know if I would. Yeah? I think I would. I'd like to hope I would. Hmm. Yeah. You've given me a lot to think about. This was a fun exercise. Thanks, Mr. Cheshire Cat, for st- stumbling into our bar. <laughs> One thing we like to do here in the back catalog, I mean, if you're listening to an older episode, there used to be a, an ad here. Mm-hmm. We've used these in the past to come back through and, and explain our current situation. Matt, will you just explain basically what's going down with Armageddon? Can you just explain it? People don't know. Yeah, but- absolutely. Here's the quick version. There was a huge meteorite. It was headed toward Earth. And we had a long conversation about it, a national debate. And ultimately, we decided that instead of sending astronauts to go up and land on the asteroid and figure out how to divert it with explosives, we would send explosive experts and just teach them how to astronaut real quick. That did not work at all. Now we've had impact. Turns out that was moronic. That did not work. Terrible idea. Yes. Yep. Way, way harder to astronaut than it is to simply light a very long fuse at the end of a roll of eight sticks of dynamite or hit a plunger while dressed up like a crazy old Western prospector. And so because of those decisions that we made and that we all (laughs) own together, we've seen most of the plant life on Earth wiped out. And we now eat synthetic sludge that comes from our synthetic sludge producers in our underground bunkers where we live with the remaining survivors. But I guess the point is, one, to send back words of wisdom to help you think through what you might do when you get to the time where you have to make that fateful decision. The fate of the future rests in your hands. But also to plead for your help as we fight for the fate of humanity on our timeline. Destin... What could people listening to the back catalog do? Yeah, we found there's really only one thing that keeps our nutrition sludge machines working. And uh, one thing. Yeah, it, it is patreon.com slash no dumb questions. Yes. Mm-hmm. We've learned yes. that if people that are listening to the back catalog will support the podcast on Patreon, for some reason, it's kind of like a smoothie machine, only it's powered by algae. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't need photosynthesis. Mm-hmm. We haven't figured that part out because there's too much volcanic ash. And it ash. comes out much slower than yes. a smoothie. I mean, it takes a minute. But once people support at patreon.com slash no questions, for some reason the sludge comes out faster. And it's not tasty, but we, yes. we appreciate that. So thank you to everyone that supports, you know, from the past. You support the future at patreon.com slash no questions. Yeah. It's where we're at. It's basically just tar and ground up caterpillars, but it's what we have. <laughs> and every time you click that link on patreon.com slash no dumb questions, one of the orphans living in this underground futuristic bunker with us finds another caterpillar. One small cup of tar and caterpillar sludge to make it through one more day. Thank you so much. I mean, won't you think of the children? Yes. Thank you so much. Patreon.com slash no dumb questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, welcome to the Twisted Knuckle. I'm, I'm really busy. A lot of people here. What can I do for you? Okay, so, <laughs> like, I have a question, I guess, about, like, how... Okay, do you watch, like, movies or anything? Uh, no. Okay, so do you read, like, books or anything? Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, did you ever read that, uh... Jim Toker book about like the ring battles and what the ring guy yeah J.R.R. Tolkien yeah totally I know yeah that's what I said (laughs) did you ever see the one about um did you ever see the one about Bilbo yeah, Bilbo Baggins got it, sir. Can you uh-huh can you hurry up? We've got I got other patrons. So anyways, like what I was wondering about is like how does how does Bilbo wear the ring? Because like when Frodo wears the ring. It's like the eye can see him and then sends evil creatures to capture the ring. But how how is it that Bilbo could previously wear the ring? Like even at his own birthday party? He had a birthday party in there? And then not be seen by the eye? Did you ever think about that? 
Uh, hey, get this get this guy some coffee, sir. Here, just drink this. We're we're just we're not going to talk about this right now. Just drink this, and you're going to be fine. What was your name, no, by the way, sir? I want. So, my name's B- Patroller. <laughs> Is it really? It is. No way. <laughs> Somebody named Boner Patroller showed up in the subreddit and asked how Bilbo's ring. <laughs> Are you serious? Thank you. We're not going to talk about that, but uh, that's great. Wait, what? No, we're not going to talk about that? Seriously? Okay. I mean, Kyle, it was such a struggle yeah. for you to get that question out. I was, I was having an issue over here. You know why I did it that way? Because it would bother me? Because I knew you'd have an issue. <laughs> yeah, it bothered me. It was no, like, uh, okay, I'm an engineer. You must communicate in sentences quickly and clearly. Okay, so so let me let me understand the question. So, okay, yeah, um, are we talking about are we talking about Lord of the Rings? Or are we talking about both? So in the Hobbit, yeah, Bilbo finds the ring in the cave and puts it on, and it doesn't summon the Nazgul and all of. Uh, Sauron's minions, right? Okay. But then when Frodo inherits the ring from Bilbo in Fellowship of the Ring, the first of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and he puts it on, he goes into this like weird netherworld place and like the bad guys can see him and Sauron can track him from there. And so it's really bad for him to put the ring on. Whereas like Bilbo just goofs around with the ring whenever he wants, like even to just duck out of his own birthday party. Is that all making sense? It is. Um, I didn't remember all that, but it makes sense. So why... I don't know. I don't know enough about Tolkien to to answer that question. Okay, so I think, and I did not go and dig around at this, but I think that the deal was that Sauron just hadn't marshaled his forces. It wasn't like Sauron was this evil that had existed forever. Like somehow he returned, and maybe that's explained in there somewhere. And he was gaining this power, and he was like making an army at the time. And the Nazgul, they're like the human ring lords i think who'd been like corrupted by the power of the ring and so i i would just i would guess that sauron wasn't powerful enough to be looking for the ring or to have his gaze reach that far yet but then it did by the time that frodo inherited the ring that would be my guess cool i'm gonna have to but you know why i'm asking you why it has nothing to do with that in my freshman philosophy class i got asked a question that i thought was really interesting about this ring and the question was, you got a ring, uh, just like the Lord of the Rings ring that you can put on and it makes you invisible. But instead of making you invisible to the eye, it makes you entirely invisible morally. How would that change the way you live? Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, morally invisible, not just no consequences, no guilt. It's a moral invisibility ring. Dude, that's crazy. I don't know, dude. I mean... My heart is corruptible, for sure. So I, I have to believe that it would affect me negatively. I have to believe that. I got to think if I didn't have to answer for anything ever to anyone, that would have a negative effect on my conduct. Yeah, I mean, power corrupts. Ultimate power corrupts. No, no, wait. Let me, how, do I, how do I say it? Hold on. Let me get this right. Lord Acton's axiom, absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah, I, I have to think that would be a form of of ultimate absolute power. It would corrupt me. I've, I've got to be honest there. So now imagine if that was coupled with a thousand year lifespan. Yeah, that's why I went with that question next. That'd be messed up, man. Because it's like the two things that that restrict our behavior, right? Like death and accountability, would both be gone in that scenario. That's why, I, th- I mean, a- accountability is kind of built in, right? How do you mean? I mean, there's there's a dozen different ways to see it. I don't want to go into it without ramping up the JPMs, but I think it's built in. You could argue uh, the existence of a moral law. You can argue all that stuff. But, you know, if you put a ring on and that went away, boy, it'd, be, it'd get dark quick. I think so, too. And I think the exercise is interesting, and we don't need to play it all out here, but I think the exercise is interesting for us, for the third chair because it really does make you think through, okay, so I do some good things. Why? Okay, so I don't do some bad things. Why? And I think we'd all like for the answer to be because I'm a decent person. And maybe that is part of it. But there might be a motivating factor that makes us seem like decent people. 
that is entirely external. I didn't like the exercise when it came up, but it was a very formative, important day of class for me. Hmm. Yeah. It makes you think about yourself in a way that we're not normally trained to do. So I could see how that'd be a big deal. You guys started talking about stupid crap about like morality or whatever. I'm going to go talk to those guys over there at that table about Bilbo more. <laughs> Sounds good, man. So, uh, yeah. Here, put, your, put your hand right here on this coffee. Take that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Oh, oh it's really freaking hot, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you get a pretty good stoner voice. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to, I'm walking into the bar and what can I do for you? Good, sir. Dude, quick. Um, just not a lot of time here. Just straight up answer. Does revving your engine charge your car battery faster? I need to know quick. What's the deal? Wow. <laughs> Not the question I anticipated. Normally people ask for alcohol. <laughs> that said, whether it makes a difference or not, it's something I do whenever I'm jump-starting another vehicle. So my heart tells me yes. But I know a science guy. Just a minute. Destin, does revving your car engine make your car battery charge faster? Yeah, totally does. Yeah, and, okay, and so it's your sense. alternator, right? Your alternator... Um, you rev that thing, you spin that thing harder and faster. Um, yeah, you make more current. It makes sense. Cause like, even if you're, if, if you're run a little low on like battery juice and you rev uh-huh. that, like your lights will go a little brighter. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. I, I mean, the alternator thing, I've heard of those. I, I kind of know how they work, but I didn't really think about that. So current is directly related to the speed of an alternator, which is a DC motor. It's like shoveling more electrons into the battery bucket. Does that make sense? I've got your answer for you, young sir. This gentleman <laughs> over here says there's some sort of fancy math formula that indicates that if you do rev that engine faster, you will get more battery faster. There you go. Thanks, man. I'm out. <laughs> that one that one was actually really easy. Mm-hmm. Hey, man. Welcome to the Twisted Knuckle. What can I get for you? Uh, hi. My name's Way to Go, Larry. And, um, can you look at this? Look at this. Does that look weird to you? Right there. No, let me pull my Dude, collar down. Sir, it's put on your my pants. neck. Oh, it's no, not, yeah. No, don't look at that. Look at this here. <laughs> Does that look weird? Can you see that? Sir, uh, that is what you call a hickey. Yeah, it is. So I was, I was making out with, I, so something happened. Uh, I was goofing around with a vacuum cleaner and that yeah. happened. Yeah. And, uh, I have like a job interview that I have to go to, but I, this, I, should I go to the job interview? Uh, yeah, just wear a turtleneck. You'll be fine, man. But then I'd be wearing a turtleneck. <laughs> uh, what is the question? Would you hire a man who's wearing a turtleneck? Uh, probably not. I don't know. If it's a black one and he's wearing blue jeans without a belt, then probably. He, he probably knows how to make phones really well. Would you hire a man who has a hickey? Is that what the question is? What is yeah. the question? Yeah. <laughs> Brett, bust out a character, man. I want to talk to you. My name's Way to Go Larry, and I have a hickey. <laughs> what is the question? The question is, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I want to go in for an interview, but I have a hickey on my neck. You can totally tell it's there. Should I wait for it to go away, or should I just go for it? First of all, this was written by a 12-year-old. <laughs> Who wants to, like, I bet this is the kind of thing adults ask. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is what we talk the, about at the our answer, soirees. The answer is it doesn't matter. You're not going to get the job anyway. <laughs> <laughs> a hickey. Have you ever thought about how, I mean, like, a hickey, you know? Is a hickey just a bruise, a suction bruise? It is. One time is a joke. Um, I told I told Dara, this is, totally should not do this. I'm like... I'm going to give you a hickey. She's like, no. I'm like, here it comes. <laughs> and I started running at her. Wait, you made like a mouth shape and chased her? It was funny. It was so funny. <laughs> Hold on just one second. I have an idea. Do you have a Do you have a stopwatch? Yeah, I can make that happen. What do you want me to do? You just hit go and I'll give you updates, okay? Okay, uh, I'm hitting go. Uh, when? Three, two, two one. One. Go. Oh, no. Are okay, you I got a, a vacuum hickey. I have a shot vac on my arm. Oh no! Wait, All how right. far up your arm did you go? Is it hideable with the sleeve? Yeah, forearm, left, fo- left forearm. Forearm? You can't. Everybody's gonna see that. I'm gonna wear a turtleneck for my arms. Oh dear. Tell me when oh, 30 dear. seconds is up. Okay, I'll let you know when 30 seconds is up. 
No, seriously, I needed an exact time. Don't joke around with me. We're taking no. data. You're done. Take stop. Stop. Okay. Okay, so I would say not hickey. <laughs> no. Um, okay. Um, okay, right. so we're, we're going to go to 30. Hold on. Wait, did you have a full seal? Okay. Right. Yeah, I've got a full seal. Um, Are you positive? 100%. Yeah, okay. it looks like this shot back, we had a water heater leak, and a plumber came over, and it looks like they used this to suck water up in the floor. Right. So the end of it is, a yeah, there's a seal. Okay. Like all your skin's kind of pulling up into there? Exactly. Okay. So when... My, my wife told me this story, but you know those little, uh, what are they one called? Minute, the, one minute, stop. One minute, we're, we're going a minute and a half. What are those things called that uh, you flip them inside out and you set them on a table and they pop up in the air? Yeah, little, uh, little uh, pop, popper things? Nipple poppers, popper, popper yeah. punches. My wife stuck one on her knee one time and fell asleep and woke up and she thought like it was bad. Yeah, you hear that Come, happening. Are we at a full minute yet? No, okay. Okay. Yeah, this why is... did you assume? No, I'll definitely tell you now. Go, stop. Okay. Okay. I don't know okay. why you're doing that on your forearm. I just wanted to see... Abdomen, small of the back? No, nothing happened, dude. I'll take a picture and tweet it Literally right now. Literally nothing. Yeah, there's how just does like... How even... Ha- how much work does that take? That's, that was my point. Hang, I wanted here. to know... Hang on a second. I'm gonna, I can reach my bicep here. <laughs> This actually kind of hurts. Dude, you could probably get more... Yeah, you could probably get more suction pressure like that. Mm-hmm. 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 Sorry. Because you... If you think about it, the the motor on the shop vac is powered by... Are you making the squeaking noises? You don't have to, you don't have to make squeaking noises. You can just pull the vacuum in your mouth. mm So... Are you doing bicep? Mm-hmm. So, like... You have to intentionally work very, very hard to make a hippie a, oh, hickey, yeah. a hickey happen. I got it. You got to work hard to make a hippie too. Check this out, though. Oh my goodness, my face, like <laughs> my mouth feels really bad. Um, uh, it's here, tired. Just do this. Tweet me a picture on the No Dumb Questions uh, Twitter account. Okay, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna put my tweet is data dot 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 uh, one. It was a minute and thirty, right? That I was sucking on my bicep. No, for me, with, with the shop back. Yeah, a uh, total of a minute and 30. I don't know what I got in, maybe like 20 seconds, and my face started hurting too much. Yeah, you can see it. No, that, there it is. All right, I'm tweeting you this. So how does a hickey happen, first of all? Like, I, I mean, you, you, you have to intentionally make it happen, right? It made my face and arm hurt, and I didn't feel pleasure. It's always, like when I was a young person, it was an inside joke of, oh, so-and-so has a hickey. But then as I matured into an adult... I realized that's the dumbest thing ever, and the only reason you would do it is if you were, like, spray-painting graffiti on the side of a building. That's the only reason you do it. You try to mark your territory with a hickey. Right, yeah. It's a mark of grotesque ownership. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, we're in agreement that hickeys are dumb. Yeah, Um, and what it would tell me is that uh, if you came in, literally, if you came in for a job interview and you've got a hickey, it tells me you're in a horribly unhealthy relationship. And that it's very likely that the train wreck that is your relationship is probably going to bleed over into your work. So wear the turtleneck. Okay, good. I'm glad we handled that. Yeah. Way to go, Larry. Have you tweeted it yet? I'm looking. Yeah, I tweeted it. Well, I tweeted it at No Dumb Questions. Oh, wow. Oh, that's gross. Yeah, you see that thing? That's really nasty. I'm glad we did this. I feel closer to you now. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Whose turn is it to ask a question? Uh, it's your turn to stagger into the bar. Oh, God, it's cold out there. What can I get for you, my man? Here's the deal. I know it's weird to ask this up front, but... Um, Probably is going to be weird. Yeah, um, can you can you guys solve a question for me and my girlfriend? Is it customary to tip on the subtotal or the total? I mean, like, hey, guys, I, I know this question that my girlfriend and I can never agree on. Let's say you're supposed to tip on the, the, the subtotal, is what I always tell her, but she thinks it's the total. So who's right? And do you count drinks in tipping? I say no, but she says yes. So so how does that work? As a bartender, I'm something of an authority on this, and it's definitely on the total. Further, 
We tend to recommend tipping not just on that which you ordered, but that which you considered ordering. Thanks for your question. <laughs> what what do you you do? Like how much do you normally tip? My standard number is 20% and yeah. It takes a lot for me to tip well below that, but if it goes really really badly, I will drop below that. If it goes really well or there's something unique about the situation, I can I'll do way better than that. Yeah. What's what's the worst is when the the kitchen has a really bad night but the waiter or the waitress is like a the front person that has to be the middle you know stuck in the middle on that that whole gig you know and so you had bad service so you want to you know let someone know but the waiter is trying hard so like what do you do so yeah. I, I always just like oh i just chalk this up as an l and i'll just tip them well and move on yeah if somebody does a really bad if i'm in that situation I'll leave one of those uh, little Christian tracts that looks like a twenty dollar bill, but is actually just the message of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that like, I'm, there. I'm, that's how I let you know I hated your work. I'm told that's how like so many people uh, decide to <laughs> to go to church. Yeah, no. Who, is it, who even prints those? Oh, just strategically, what is going on in the brain of the person who's like, I bet this would work. How do we make people hate Christians? That's what they're thinking. Like, the, the only right way to leave that is with a crisp hundred right next to it. So somebody's like, I got 120 bucks. Oh, well, I got a hundred bucks in religious proselytizing. Yeah, I'll still take it. So 20, so here's the question. Do you tip pre-tax or post-tax? I've never even thought about it. I just, I just tip on whatever the total is. Okay. So I guess I tip on tax. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. People are benefiting f- for the government taxing me. Interesting. Yeah. Cause you hate taxes. I figured you would like, you would, not tip someone else against against you're you know. trying to bait me into something that then you'll be disappointed in me i see i see how it is nope no i'm not taking the bait i love taxes and i think that we could all use a little bit more of that right now <laughs> okay that's my opinion for real that's what i actually think <laughs> right now. so you got uh, nothing on me well done all right i think it's your turn to stumble into the bar i think it is Do you have a question for me Hey, somebody, somebody help me, please. My name is, it's Mespa24. It's an absolutely desperate situation. Cal- uh, calm down, calm down. Co- come here, co- come up to the bar. What can I do to help you? I need to know how a bill passes through government. My girlfriend has an assignment which she has to propose a bill reforming euthanasia laws, but what would the process be for creating the bill to it being implemented? Thank you. <laughs> Did it sound really desperate when they answer, asked it? That's yeah, it really did. It really did. It sounded like there was some real urgency to this question. Hey, quick, do my homework. So that's what that one was. Yes, that's exact. Or my girlfriend's, rather, which will free her up to give me hickeys. So what I would <laughs> I would suggest is uh, I would immediately forward the Schoolhouse Rocks, I'm just a Bill song to this person. That's what they need in their life. Did you ever see the, uh, the SNL... Uh, executive order schoolhouse rock oh no that sounds amazing <laughs> well see okay, wh- when was it written that matters uh it was during obama uh-huh which is really interesting it was a rare point of seeming pushback on the obama administration it was it was funny yeah basically you've got uh this kid and he's like hey i'm here in the steps of the capitol building how does bill become law and this bill walks out and he's like well son here's how it works Ta-da. i'm an amendment to be or whatever he does and all of this stuff and then uh then this uh this kind of fat guy with smoking a cigarette comes out dressed up as a bill and the kid's like hey what are you and he's like i'm an executive order and the song kicks up and he's like i'm an executive order and i pretty much just happened <laughs> and then, and then the Obama, song's over <laughs> that's it <laughs> then he smokes a cigarette some more <laughs> that's pretty good yeah it made me happy it, it makes you happy. wonder how yeah i mean the executive order thing is very very strange and mm-hmm. this goes back to your you know your nail saw gun bat discussion that we've had several times off air yeah. you know you you make a, a good point that whoever is in power at the time they go for whatever power is necessary in order to get their ideas to be the rule for everyone. Because they're definitely right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But once you free up those mechanisms in order to do it, as you correctly 
brought to my attention because I'd never thought about it this way. As soon as those mechanisms exist and the person is out of power, those mechanisms then exist for the next person who more often than not is your political opponent. Mm -hmm. So in general, it's a bad thing to make, you know, overarching executive, you know, omnipotent power for any one group because, you know, at some point in the future, another group's going to have it and they're not going to like what you think. Yep. Process is very, when I took my first government class in college, I did a poli sci minor. The, the prof kept pushing this idea of process is so important. Process, process. And I was like, I don't care about process. I care about issues. Like this thing is right and this thing is wrong and somebody needs to do something about that. And she wouldn't let us, I, I figured political science, we'll just debate stuff like a cable news show and we'll yell at each other and it'll be great. But all she wanted to do was explain processes and checks and balances and all of this. And I didn't get it. Never did get it. Graduated without getting it. I think I'm starting to get it. Like, you know, if one president says to his base, like, hey, I'm going to get you the thing you want using this mechanism that's kind of weird. The base might be excited about it, but they won't be excited about it when the next president does it for the opposite kind of stuff. Yeah. Process is good. Is that the point? So how does a bill become law? Do, do you remember this from civics? Uh, yeah. Any, any member of Congress can create the law and submit it, and it has to be approved in that particular house first. And then if it passes there, it goes to the other, the other house. For example, the House of Representatives has to approve it. And if they do then it would move forward and, and go to the Senate, right? And if yeah. they agree on it, and then at that point, it can be signed into law by the executive branch. Yeah, and there can be a few detours along the way. Like, uh, so if one house, obviously we're talking about the United States system here, but if one of our houses of government passes it, the other might come back with amendments or pass it with amendments, and then you would have to have another committee come together. And then usually after a bill is introduced by a member of Congress, there will be, it goes to an appropriate subcommittee that deals with that category of bill first. And so a lot of proposed bills die in committee before they ever make it to a vote. So there's, there are lots of places for that to get killed. And then obviously the president has to sign off on it in our system. And if he signs off on it, it becomes law. If the president does not sign off on it or rejects it, officially vetoes it, it becomes not law, goes back to the House and the Senate. Do you remember what the percentage is that they have to pass it by to beat him? Uh, I thought it was two-thirds. Very, very well done. Very yeah. well done. Yep. Well, one thing that's interesting to me is that, for example, in our states, I'm in Alabama, you're in Wyoming, um, the governor has something called line item veto. Yeah. So, so you can go in there, and that's that's pretty interesting, isn't it? It's one of those things where you swallow a spider to catch a fly in terms of the process. So you've heard of like these, the term omnibus bill? No, I've heard the term, yes. What does it mean? Um, this is the bill that we tend to do once a year, and it's like everything everybody wants all at once. So I think the pure way to think of a bill is like, oh, like this guy is in our discussion here. It's like, well, you know, there should be, there should be a law about killing the elderly. So we'll just make a law about our bill about that and then we'll pass it and that'll be it. Except that bill is probably going to include like some soybean subsidy for Southern Minnesota also. Right. Wait, what? Why? I thought we were talking about whether or not it was okay to put down the elderly. Why are we doing uh, soybean stuff now? And the reason is that this is where all of the political favors exchange are exchanged and that grosses some people out. It's also kind of how compromise works. And so the omnibus bill is like this monster bill with a billion things in it. Nobody has enough time to read these kind of bills. They're huge. And these are usually your spending bills. So when your government shutdown stuff happens, a lot of times it's around these very multifaceted bills. So the idea is if you have a line item veto, you can kill the stuff you don't want. But I don't know. Can you guess why people don't like the line item veto? Yeah, it puts way more power in the hands of the governor. So are you for it? If I was governor, I'd be for it. <laughs> That's so the right answer. <laughs> it really Dude, is. Dude, that is so the right answer. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. And, and the thing is then if you pass a multifaceted bill, bill where say it has five elements and it's a good piece of legislation where all five has to happen or this doesn't work and then you have a line item veto, I, ooh, that would you ever even bother passing the bill? 
Yeah, it depends. I mean, that when government's working well and you have people that are actually compromising with each other. You, you know, one thing I, I heard that was rather interesting, back in the day, senators and representatives lived in D.C., but but now they all get on planes and they, they go home. W- was this Ben Sass that said this in that book? Them? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the, the point he was making is that these people are not communing with each other. They're, they're not eating at each other's houses. They're not, you know, supporting each other in community. So there's less of that give and take that's going on. I found that to be very, very interesting. And it made me think about what I would do if I was ever a lawmaker representing a state or if I was a governor and all this stuff. How would you approach these things? And sitting on the outside looking in, you you say things like, oh, man, these people aren't getting stuff done, blah, blah, blah. But some of us like that. Yeah. To me, when you go in, I don't know. I, I wonder if it would be like stepping in the La Brea Tar Pits when you, when you walk into the, the House or the Senate, right? And then all of a sudden, the gravity hits you of what's going on. Like every president, if you if, at the inauguration of every president, it's interesting because the, the president that's leaving usually has a smile on their face. And the president that's arriving is usually like, oh, man. I caught the garbage truck. You know what I mean? It's like, whoa, yeah. this just got real. And so they're not smiling. I mean, watching Ben Sass's career, he is from... Nebraska. Yeah, but I don't know how many districts there are. So he would be from like, I don't know what you call it, like the second district of Nebraska. So the first would probably be Omaha. It's the big town. The second is Lincoln. And I think he's from Lincoln. And then I think the third district includes Grand Island, where I used to live. And the representative from Grand Island when I was there to the U.S. House of Representatives was Tom Osborne. You ever heard that name? No, I haven't. That totally surprises me. You're kind of a college football fan. He is the longtime legendary Nebraska Cornhuskers football coach. Oh, yeah. Well, he doesn't matter because he's not Bear Bryant. He's not Nick Saban. So, yeah. (laughs) Okay. So, you're not talking about like real football. You're talking about... Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Yeah, we're talking about only like a few national championships, not every year, (laughs) except this year. That hurt. Go ahead. What uh, facts? <laughs> uh, my team uh, won five games, then gave up a thirty-five to three lead on homecoming week and lost out the rest of the season. And didn't go to a bowl, so it could be worse, buddy. That's rough. The point is, Tom Osborne is a really optimistic, beloved dude in Nebraska, and you know he went off with all of this optimism. And I mean, he's had a little office in this the, the little kind of strip mall office area next to Sonic out there in Grand Island. And he was going to be like man of the people and all of this stuff. And he went and it was a dumpster fire. And I think he only did one term and just came home and was like, wow, I I ain't fixing that. And I think Ben Sass a little bit when he went felt great optimism and he's trying hard. I don't agree with all of his politics for sure. I I like his attitude, but um, I sense discouragement in him after reading his book. I think it is like the tar pits a little bit. It it's an, icky difficult place to get things done yeah to do good i should say to do good it's a difficult place yeah sorry i couldn't help you with your paper sir but uh yeah have a good one schoolhouse rock that'll get it done i I learned what i need to my girlfriend will be thrilled Hey, uh, I need an expert. Is there someone in here? Uh, I can serve mixed drinks. Do you know uh, anything, like anything, about solar winds? No, sir. I know things about mixed drinks. This, this is my question. So, can you generate lift using solar winds? I mean, if you think about it, by the way, my, my name is Tater Attack. While sailing in water on Earth, you can tack, like back and forth. You know what's up. W- which is, you know, blah, blah, blah. You've got this wing, the sail, and you got lift. But if, if you're sideways and then using the keel to travel into the wind, here's my question. Oh, I don't know why you're looking at me like that, but can you generate lift with these solar winds and travel around space with that? I can find space on my bar to lift this alcohol and pour it into your glass. (laughs) It's a pretty good question, isn't it? It's a pretty good question. Uh, Again, I refer to my knowledge of Count Dooku's spacecraft, which appeared to harness solar wind to move itself through the galaxy to commit space crimes. 
That's all I know. I don't know. I all I know about solar wind is our one conversation we had about the Parker Solar Space Probe. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to you on this one. Before we do that, like Dooku's craft did, it, he yeah he threw the sail thing out there, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Hmm. I mean that has to be what that's an allusion to, right? Is some kind of solar wind. But the thing that I don't think makes any sense about that is Dooku's craft is in deep space far more often than it's anywhere near a star. So I don't see how that would be very effective. I mean, surely solar wind dissipates as it spreads out, right? Say that one more time. Well, surely solar wind dissipates the further you get from its source, right? Yeah, it does. Um, So it's like this. I did some reading up on this. The Japanese actually did it. Like, everybody's like, oh, the solar sails have, well, how does that work? And the Japanese are like, let's launch one. What are we doing? And they had this really clever design. It's it's a thing called the Icarus is the name of their satellite. Um, I-K-A-R-O-S. I would have to look up what that means. I don't know what it really means. Really? It has a K? It's not a C? No, it's not. But Icarus, obviously, and, you know, oh, w- was Icarus a Greek or a Roman mythological Greek? story? Greek? Tell me tell me the story. I would like to hear you tell me about Kid Icarus because most of the stuff I know comes from video games. Okay. Well, Icarus was this character who was um, eager to supplant the authority and achievements of his dad, who was like a great builder or something. I don't remember his name, but it's famous. His dad had made the uh, the thing where the Minotaur lives, the maze. What's the word for it? David La- uh, labyrinth. labyrinth. Yeah. Thank you. The Labyrinth on the island of Crete, which a lot of people think is Atlantis. And so it's a lot to live up to. And so Icarus keeps wanting to achieve greater and greater things. And so trying to imitate his father's craftsmanship, he makes these wings and uses some kind of wax, I think it was, to stick them to his back. So then he achieved flight. And he was like, I can do whatever I want because I've achieved flight. And so he decided to fly as far as he could. And he flew up close to the sun and the sun got too hot. And it melted the wax and the wings came off and then he fell back to earth and he died. He did die though in the... in the. I think so. The myth? Interesting. I don't know. You want me to go look it up? Uh, No. No, that's fine. Okay. I, I'm satisfied. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting story about like trying to trying to out dad your dad or trying to be better than your dad i don't know it's an interesting interesting thing so this spacecraft that the japanese made um it's it a solar sail is basically you put a presented area out there facing the sun or facing away from the sun however you look at it and what you can do is you can actually get force like newtonian force um on the surface of this sail just by light pressure right I remember when I was young, we used to go to ham radio festivals, which is a thing. And the biggest ham fest in the world was in Dayton, Ohio. And every year in Dayton, there was like some little gadget or toy that seemed to be all the rage. And by the way, that's the first time I heard about lithium batteries was at Dayton, Ohio at a ham fest. Yeah, it was a big deal. Polymer batteries. We were like, polymer, that's plastic. Yeah, lithium plastic batteries. We were like, what? So it was it was kind of a neat thing. But um, they had these little toys called radiometers. Have you ever heard of those? No, I've not. So a radiometer looks like a light bulb. It's the same shape. It's made out of glass, except it's clear. And on the inside, there's a needle sticking straight up. And on this needle, there rests a, it looks like a, I'm not going to say a windmill, but it, because it's horizontal. You've seen these horizontal windmills, right, with a helical type fo- airfoil on them. Basically, it's four paddles. Wait, 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 wait. A horizontal windmill? Yeah, you've never seen those? You mean you mean like if you lifted the case off of an outdoor air conditioner, like the fan that just sits there and points up like to Yeah, kind of like that. Exactly. Okay. Kind of like that, only instead of a fan with just, you know, slanted planes around the central rotational axis, it looks like a helix. Like if you could take a strand of DNA and turn it up on its side. Yeah. You've mm-hmm. seen those, right? Mm-hmm. I can picture it now. Yeah. Those are windmills and they use an airfoil design to do it. They're really clever. I've often thought it would be really cool to put those in the middle of a road, like like a, an interstate. You've seen like these concrete things on interstates, the barrier. Yeah. How mm-hmm. cool would it be to put a bunch of those little 
vertical windmills or horizontal windmills, however you think about them, I, I guess they're technically vertical windmills, put those straight down the interstate and just generate electricity for things like lights on the road itself. I love ideas like that. Have, have you flown into Denver? Yeah. Well, yeah, you did because you flew in there for the eclipse. Right. Did you ride Did you ride the train from one terminal back to the baggage area? You know, I, I can't say that I remember it if I did. And then Alan Roach is like, welcome yes. to Denver International Airport. And it yes. is sexy. Yes. Holy cow. That guy's the voice of the Minnesota Vikings now. He's very talented. Whatever the case, when you're on the train, the sights and sounds are Alan Roach's voice, the little jingle, dingle, dingle thing that it does. And then the whole corridor is lined with these tiny little fans, like like you'd imagine children on the boardwalk in Atlantic City in the 1920s carrying along. The little pinwheels. Their, yeah, the little pinwheel things. And they all kind of spin as the trains go by. And I think the idea is they're recapturing energy from the train. I have no idea if it actually does anything or not, because it seems like there are fewer every time I look. But the principle, I really dig. That's no, they're they're there for a reason. Like if if you have an Well, they air, were there for a reason at first. I just am not sure it worked. Well, I don't yeah, I see what you're saying. But but it could be for airflow. Like, um it could be to generate turbulence and to create oh. a stronger boundary layer or or a more distant boundary layer on the uh it might be to create a different type of flow in the train tunnel because clever man i never thought about that like if you have a pipe so water there's something called a boundary condition so water tries to stay at the same velocity as whatever it's touching and yeah, i learned that from a video i saw recently on laminar flow yeah exactly and so the um as you go away from the edge of the pipe the water shears more and you can pick up velocity right and there's all kinds of things that engineers do to try to make flow more laminar or more turbulent. And what you're saying there sounds like like it would it would tend to make the flow more turbulent. But I, I don't know why they would want to do that because obviously that's dumb. Everybody knows laminar flow is best. So yeah, that seems to be a popular opinion for the last 36 hours. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so getting back to this uh, solar satellite, this light sail. So. The Japanese did a really clever thing. And, and the question, getting back to the question that was asked by uh, Tater Attack, was can you can you generate lift using solar winds? And the answer is kind of. Because it, as I understand a sail, like on a sailboat, you have a keel of the ship down in the water. And the whole reason it works is because you're pushing against the water. So like as, as the wind is blowing in one direction... You turn the sail and you push against the water to go in a certain direction, right? Like you can right. move laterally. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is in space, there's nothing to push against. So no, you can't you can't push against the nothing in order to tack into the solar wind. This is look just straight up. This is Destin's understanding. I'm not referencing a book right now. This is the way I understand physics to work. Um, I would love it if I'm wrong about this because that would mean Wait, we, we could do yeah, so much more me, stuff. Let me think that through for a second. Okay. What you're describing definitely makes sense when you're talking about rowing. Yeah. I and mean, you put an oar in the water. The only reason you move is the pressure exerted against another surface. And yeah. Theoretically, you know, if if you could, if there were two layers of water and you could dip all the way down into something more viscous, but still float on something less viscous like water, you could row even faster because you can only go as fast as you can push against the thing in which you're floating. Oh, that right? is a My... fun idea. That is a fun idea. Yeah. Like if you that... reach your paddle out and push against the bank as you do when you're pushing off in a kayak. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not. I'm not sure it works the same way when you sail. I, I think that just moves things because, I mean, you can put a sail in the air and it's not working against anything other than a little bit of air and it still generates movement. It puts lift into the sail. I mean, it'd be sloppy and out of control. You wouldn't be able to, I mean, you'd have to build mechanisms to control it. But to me, it seems like if you tried to row in space, that would be an obvious failure. But it feels like if solar wind is something that's measurable as you suggest it is with the, the Parker uh, solar probe conversation, why couldn't you generate lift? 
mean, isn't anything that would move over like a, a foil or a sail, couldn't it theoretically generate lift even if it's just a little bit? Well, it, it moves. So, so I think the the answer is you can generate force or not generate force. You can like receive momentum from the sun, which you can equate to like a force of thrust, right? And so what I read said that if you had like an 800 meter by 800 meter sail, you could get about a Newton of force out of that. 800 meter by 800 meter. Yeah. That's what I read. A Newton, like, like a firm flick. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I, what do you mean? A firm flick? What does that mean? Well, how much is a Newton? I mean, that, that that's not much over the course of 800 meters by 800 meters. You, you know, I feel a little embarrassed right now because I don't have a, like a, you know, w- when I think of a pound, I can picture a pound, but I don't have a, a Newton in my head. Like, hey, go pick up a pack of cards or something like that. I, I'm a little embarrassed by that. That's interesting. Huh. Well, but, but a Newton's a measure of force, right? Like it's, I think of it as like how hard you shove something. Chug something? Shove Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. So a Newton's like 0.2 pounds. Yeah, like a firm flick. What do you mean flick? I don't understand. Well, what I you... mean, if I walk up to you and flick you like about as hard as I can. Like a thump? Yeah, like a thump. Like, I, like, you know, like... Do you call, like, a, do you call like thumping somebody with, with your finger, you call that flicking them? A thump is when you stick out your middle knuckle and make a fist with the rest of your hand uh-huh. and tap somebody right on their solar plexus, right on their, like the middle of their chest. Thump. What? Like knocking on a door is a thump to you? Yeah, it's like a sailor tap or a thump. Thump. Really? Yeah, a flick. No. A flick it... is when you make like that that sign of the devil that they warned us about back when we were kids. And you take your middle finger and you push it against your thumb and build up all this force. And then finally, mm, you let it go. That's you, a flick. That is fascinating. We use different words for that. I use the we word. We should do a podcast. We're different. <laughs> so we used to play this game in uh, junior high called Thump Knuckles. And you, you put your hands together and you hold them out and the okay. other person gets to thump your hand as hard as they can. It sounds like a middle school game. Okay. Yeah. We called it thump knuckles. And so when you thump something, it's like when you, you know, make a circle with your, your middle finger and your thumb and you just, you mm-hmm. know, I'll, I'll thump, you know, you thump something. Yeah. Yeah. Here. And, thump. Yeah. Yes. This is knocking. Uh, that's a flick. That's knocking on a door. That's interesting. I've never heard it called a flick. No, I would also say thump as a thing that... Um, an authority figure might use if somebody is being unruly and out of control in like an encounter with a policeman or something and they don't like really want to hurt somebody but they want to get their attention so they might give them a little bit of a thump I like this discussion wow man yeah so a flick we just went from Greek mythology gesture. to mm-hmm. Japanese yes. spacecraft to yes. you know the philology associated with uh, junior high activities that's interesting yes. All in an imaginary bar. <laughs> That's neat. Here, let me land the plane or let me know. No, land. no, not yet. Not yet. One question. Okay. So when you play paper football, what do you do to the football when you kick a field goal? You thump it. You flick it. Oh my wow. goodness. Wow. Yeah, you flick that. That yeah. is heavy. It's so weird how wrong you are. This is the most important discussion we've ever had. Yeah. It's weird how long we were sort of friends. Yeah. And that was cool. Yeah. But it's neat that it's gone deeper. (laughs) Oh, God, you're making me do the wheezy laugh. (laughs) Okay, so... 0.2 pounds is a Newton. Yeah. Can that move a sail? Oh, definitely. So the cool thing about that is... Okay, so imagine you're going to go on a deep interplanetary mission, like to... Pluto or something like that. Or I guess some people would argue Pluto's not a planet, but let's say you're going to Neptune. So you can do it with chemical energy, but the cool thing about this is that light pressure from the sun is always there. And so if you want to use like an ion thruster and you want to carry a bottle of xenon with you, for example, and you want to shoot little, you know, pieces of xenon out the back of your spacecraft at really, really high velocities that's going to give you some thrust, like a very, very low thrust, Mil, you know, millinewtons or whatever. I, I don't I don't know actual units of thrust on ion thrusters. I should. Impulse power. Im, yeah. So when you talk about rocket engines, the gas mileage is called specific impulse. That's that's how that works. And, it, and it's measured in seconds. 
just roll with it. So, mm-hmm. so long story short, you have to take your fuel with you on these long duration space missions. The cool thing about solar sails is that you have to take no fuel with you. You just have to put more or less presented area in front of the in front of the the sunlight, and then that's how you vary your thrust. It's like when you put your hand outside of the car when you're a kid and you you turn your hand upright and you catch more wind and it pushes you back real yeah. hard. So you feather it down and you and you put less presented area in in that that wind. Mm-hmm. You can do that with sunlight. And so if you have the ability to control the attitude of your spacecraft, you can present more to the sun or you can turn it you can turn it off and, and like feather. Yeah, it's tacking. But no, it's not tacking. My understanding of tacking is you you present a certain angle to the wind and then you are pushing against the water underneath your boat and that's making you go in a direction opposite of the direction of the wind. Like the wind, yeah, you tack into wind. Yeah. So I thought that's what you were saying was that you could you could use a solar sail to move even at an angle that would eventually take you toward the sun. Are you not saying that? I am not saying that. You, you could only use it to go away. Yeah, if I wanted to do what you just described, what I would do, just thinking about orbital mechanics, is I would put myself on a highly elliptical orbit using that solar sail, knowing that Kepler is going to bring me back towards the sun. And so I would figure out how to come back to the sun by how I go away from it using the sun. That's what I would do. How prominent is debris in space outside of orbit? Uh, there's there's a lot of it, but there's, I mean, there's way more space. <laughs> it just seems like a solar sail would have to be huge based on the figure you just gave me. Yeah. Like it would have to be an unbelievably gigantic mechanism that would come out of the front of a vessel to pull it away from the sun. How is that thing not going to get cut to shreds by debris that it runs into? Because it would have to be light. Space is way more empty than you think is the upshot to your to your question. But what if it's only 99.9999999999999% empty and you happen to run into that point zero 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 whatever one? I mean, it wouldn't take much to wreck a space sail. Yeah. I mean, micrometeorites hit the International Space Station all the time. I mean... But it's made of metal. It is. Yeah. But even a, a tiny, tiny little micrometeorite going at, you know, a fraction of the speed of light. I mean, I'm not saying they go that fast. I mean, I guess everything's a fraction of the speed of light, but th- they can do some crazy damage. Like the, uh, there's a PhD guy that was talking to me about what I should pursue. And his whole area of research was on micrometeorite impacts on spacecraft. And it's fascinating. But I want to tell you what the Japanese did to, to be clever. Tell me. Yeah. So when you stick your hand out the window and you were to present the area to the wind or feather it away and have less presented area, that's that's neat and it's good, but it takes a lot of energy to turn a spacecraft, right? Would you agree? I wouldn't think it would take that much energy to turn a spacecraft in space, actually. That's counterintuitive to me. It it takes it takes power. You know, if you have reaction wheels, that's one way you could do it. But but listen to what these guys did, and this is so ingenious. Um, JAXA, the Japanese space agency, they have a large solar sail with built-in LCD crystals, like liquid crystals. So what they can do is they can turn on and off different parts of the sail and make it opaque or transparent at any point in time. So imagine a sail in front of you, the sun is to your back and you have this large square in front of you and you Mm -hmm. have four quadrants. It's like a Cartesian coordinate plane. You have four quadrants to that sail and you say, you know what I want to do right now? I want to turn. I want to turn my spacecraft to the right. So what they'll do is they'll make the right two quadrants transparent and they'll make the left two quadrants uh, opaque and that will apply. Because it's not wind wind. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's like having a, it's like having a uh, wind turbine that you can choose if you want to make the blades invisible or not. It's like having a kite that oh, you can turn wow. part. Isn't that genius? That's genius, and, and yeah, it's amazing. That'd work. Yeah, it wouldn't give you full access to everything. I mean, you'd still only be able to move a certain, yeah, you know, in a certain radius, a certain range away from the source of the solar wind 
Exactly. Yeah. But you could do a lot with it. Exactly. I mean, it could cut your energy consumption by 40% on turning alone. Okay, I'm looking here at the Wikipedia page for solar sails. It says the total force exerted by 800 by 800 meter solar cell is 5 newtons or 1 pound, 1.1 pounds. So I told you the wrong numbers earlier, but that's a significant that's a significant amount of force. And so for example, the International Space Station way up there in orbit, it still has drag up there. There are still like, you know, fractions of a fraction of atmosphere up there. And so it slowly has drag and it starts falling back to Earth. And so every once in a while they have to reboost and do things like that. 1.1 pounds persistent, like forever. Like if you were able to do that or... That would eliminate that need to boost. Exactly. Or you could turn off using your fancy uh, liquid crystals. You could turn off the solar cell as you're heading towards the sun. But every time you go around the Earth and you're heading away from the sun, if you turn those sails on, you turn them opaque, it would pull you further away from the sun. You could go into a higher orbital inclination how cool is that yeah and you just do it on every lap yeah it wouldn't be a perfect orbit but it would be effective yeah but i mean it's all math and we could totally figure it out i mean that's that's like a simulation that you and i can understand the math behind that and so these guys that are smart enough to come up with that sort of thing i mean these these orbital mechanics guys and gals at nasa and all these people they're brilliant so how cool is that man if you if you hooked me up to an MRI when we talk, it would look completely different when I am explaining to you stuff from my world than when I'm trying to use the same brain to apply casual reason to the stuff that you study. Because the same reason from your world applies to my world and the same reason from my world applies to your world is just that when I'm not trained in how to do it, it's all like I'm trying to add up intuition and experience and stuff that's happened and that I've observed, but never really thought about or categorized. I'm trying to do it all at once. And so I get a little bit quiet when we're talking, but it ain't from boredom. It's just, it accesses a different part of my brain and I really like it. Yeah. And so like hooking you up to an MRI when I'm talking is very similar to how I feel differently when you're talking and I'm hooking myself up to a shop vac. <laughs> okay. We're adults. We have families and jobs. Uh, oh, I shouldn't. I shouldn't talk about that stuff. Okay, cool. <laughs> no, I, that's just an observation unrelated. And okay. I have one last Isn't question. Isn't it weird for you. that we are like, we're adults. I was thinking about that today as I was buying a water heater because ours broke. I was like, man, this is something my dad would have done. That's an adult thing to do. We don't yeah. we don't have hot water at the house. Well, daddy's got to go get a hot water heater. Yeah, and daddy's got to bring in a coupon from a competitor to see if they'll price match. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I don't do that. Did you do that? No, I didn't. I didn't. It was an emergency. No. I had hours to buy a hot water heater. So, oh, uh, can I help you, sir? Yeah, uh, I guess I had just one more question about things. Oh, well, um, what's your what's your name there, sir? I'm Tater my Attack. My name's Dr. Stivburl. <laughs> my name's Dr. Stivburl. Okay, what's up? And I guess what I wanted to know was, <laughs> why why do people always watching a Star Trek? Uh, well, one more time, Dr. Stivburl. Why, why are people always... Yeah, remember, I am a doctor. Okay, sorry. My question is... Why do people always watching a Star Trek? <laughs> lowercase star, lowercase Trek. <laughs> Those are the funniest ones, aren't they? When, <laughs> when people show up and they don't even have the proper grammar. Or just what does that question mean? Why is Star Trek popular? Shall we interpret it that way? Um. Well, I mean, if you went to the actual post, did they did they flesh out the idea or the, the question? Yeah, let me uh, zip back over here. I do like it when people that listen to the podcast see these questions and they're not a total jerk to the people. I really like that a lot. When are people a total jerk? I think they're great. Yeah, exactly. I and, mean, and we've picked a few of these questions that are just ludicrously funny. I mean, they're they're goofy, like way out there. I think there's going to be a even further inside joke now when <laughs> when these uh, these travelers stumble into the subreddit and like, oh goodness, you know what we should do? We should put the uh, a link to the subreddit at the top of the show notes so people can just go like, if you're into Reddit, you could subscribe to that. That'd be rad. I think it's a good idea. I've looked it up. Uh, the follow-up question is, uh, why do people always watching a Star Trek? Exclamation point. And then there is no further clarification. Hey, man. There you go. Let me address one thing, though. Okay. 
we've been asked several times to put a note in the sidebar of the subreddit to explain that this is a subreddit for a podcast. No. Why? Well, why would we ruin all the fun? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I think it's the goofiest subreddit on the internet. I absolutely love it. The, uh, oh gosh, what was the one? There was one, yeah, on that hickey thread from Way to Go Larry. Yeah. The top comment on it is from Wilda666, and it simply says, this sub needs moderation. (laughs) (laughs) Your question was not answered, way to go, Larry. Instead, you caused an existential crisis for all the other users of the subreddit. Yeah. Anyway, that was fun. Here's my observation for the day. What's that? We picked some really deep, complex, good questions. We picked some goofy questions that looked, frankly, more like possibly drunken typos. But the thing is, I feel like it once again proves that there really is no such thing as a dumb question because all everything can prompt a conversation. There's something good to think about. We had a good conversation about the hickey thing. We did science <laughs> together over the hickey question. Yeah. <laughs> so we kind of we kind of ribbed some of the questioners a little bit, but I feel like I would like to just announce to you, my friend, and to the third chair that I'm grateful to the people who typed in these questions and made it happen, and I'm I'm grateful that they gave us something to talk about. Me too, and, and I'm I'm super thankful for the person who compiled all the questions. They went through the entire subreddit, and uh, they went back and they they compiled every single time a drunken stranger walked into the bar. They uh, compiled it. So a big thank you to was Mr. Overy, Mavovery. Right? Mavovery. yeah, M- Mavovery. yeah. Man, that is a tough one. Yeah, no kidding. And keep that coming. Can we do this again? Because this was really fun. It doesn't have to be in a bar next time. We can we can set it somewhere else. But we should do this again. That sounds good. I'm game. And th- this, this is a blast. Yeah. Okay. All right. More to come. <laughs> <laughs>